social media, you're joining us now. I'm John Sandifer with John Sandifer Ministries, and we're at Wednesday night at the cross at Mount Sinai, located at 192 Mount Sinai Road, and we're studying the book of Ephesians, and we're glad you're here with us, and hope you will uh, be touched by God in something that is said or done here tonight, okay? Yeah. Amen. Right, we're in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, and uh, I have handouts here. Joy, you get one, and everybody else gets one. And I think there would, will be one left over to bring back to me. All right, there you go. Mm -hmm. Now, you'll notice that they don't start chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, because last class's handouts were the first three pages or four pages, I believe. What page does it start with? Five. Right, five. You got the, the first four pages of last class, okay? So I gave you the rest of the chapter tonight, whether we finish it all or not. I did, I got it Okay. Spiritual Enrichment, chapter four, book of Ephesians. This is a commentary class. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Right, praise God. Amen. Uh, we're going to just kind of uh, do a passing review uh, of what we finished up on last class. Uh, we were in verse 10 and 11, and, and verse 10 says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. You remember we talked about the, that he descended when he died on the cross. His spirit went into Hades and preached uh, the gospel there like we just spoke about. And then after that, he rose again by the Amen. power of, uh, of God, of Almighty God, Father Amen. God. And he ascended up to sit at the right hand of, of the Father. And a lot was accomplished when that happened. Spiritually, yeah. a whole lot was accomplished. But what jumped out to me when I was going over this this afternoon, this, the, this last phrase, that he might fill all things. That had got by me a little bit, okay? Or words, he ascend, descended, did what he did in the bowels of hell, came back up and resurrected to sit at the right hand of the Father that he might fill all things. That tells me that before he did that, all things weren't full. Okay? Right? Right. Mm -hmm. And he has filled all things. Things, anything that was empty, anything that was lacking, anything that was undone yeah. before the crucifixion and resurrection, his ascension into heaven filled all things. His resurrection filled all things. I don't know how to classify it. I don't know whether it's the death, burial, and resurrection. Probably that the package of that caused the filling of all things. You, you think your life is empty? It's not. You just believe it in that direction because he filled all things. What we're looking for is there, okay? There's, there's plenty of peace for everybody. God's not going to run out, okay? Amen. Amen. It's here, all right? Yeah. There's plenty of joy for everybody, okay? You don't feel like, okay, everybody else has got it. Joy has run out. I can't have mine. No, it's there. Amen. He has filled everything that was empty. I mean, even to the degree of prosperity, financial prosperity even. He has filled all that. I believe there's so much undiscovered gold in the earth. I've read this. In places, there's so much undiscovered gold in the world that there's more undiscovered than there has than there's already in existence right now. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Hallelujah. The way this society values gold and there's more to be found than what we have in hand. My goodness. That he Amen. might fill all things. I'm sorry I get excited about stuff Amen. like that. Amen. You know, Joy, Joy tells me I, 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 I talk too loud sometimes. You know, I mean, I, I have people that tell me, man, you get excited, don't you? Yeah, I do. When he's talking about filling all things and the empty places in my life, I mean, that filling is already there. All I got to do is somehow lay hands on it by faith and pull it yeah. in. God, God's going to help me. If I start pulling, he's going to reach down and just cause it to come on in. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. Amen. That's what he does with the things through faith. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise, Praise God. Amen. Okay, I'll get on. This same Jesus who descended into the realms below 
also after three days ascended far above all heavens, above all things in the spiritual realm or the fourth dimension. We're not going to go back to that fourth dimension, but remember what we're talking about. Three-dimensional kingdom that we live in right now that we see, okay? And, and But there's a fourth dimension that's here right now. I mean, if we could see it, we could step over into it, praise God. It's a spiritual dimension, all right? I, we won't cover that uh, again for a while. Uh, these two verses, verses 9 and 10, contrast each other. Both of those verses were talking about a dissension <coughs> and an ascension. In verse 11, where we really start tonight, we started last class, but he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, there's reasoning behind my redundancy in the rest of this class. You're going to hear things that I've talked about before, okay? Okay. I don't get bored, just bear with me. Listen, because in the second and third and fourth hearing of things, you begin to become sensitive to what's being talked about. Your, your mental apparatus starts being acclimated to the way things are being said. And you begin to pick up a little bit more than what you had before. And maybe the very thing that is keeping you from fully walking in the giftedness that you should be walking in, I'm not saying you are in that place, but if that's true of you, it might be that one very thing that you need to get you over into walking fully into the gifts and, and the destiny God has for you. That's my heart, to see every person that is in the sound of my voice walking fully in the destiny and purpose that, that God designed for them. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We covered this again. We'll cover it tonight. Redundancy again. Apostolic secession is not taught in the Bible. There are no longer any foundational apostles. We, we are studying that there... The, the 12 original apostles, uh, Judas replaced by Matthias, they were foundational apostles, okay? They, they, they were responsible for founding the church. They were responsible for, for uh, uh, seeing and overseeing the scripture in, in our 31,102 verses of the Bible being written, okay? But, but those offices of those apostolic offices, uh, they cease to exist in a way uh, as far as being foundational uh, when John, uh, the Apostle John died in, in 95, to somewhere in 9500 AD, okay, when he was the last apostle, apostle to die. Uh, then the rest of the apostles, be, that they be, when they appeared on the scene, they began walking in the gifts these fivefold ministry gifts that were given to the church by Jesus, uh, they were the apostles of today are no longer foundational. They're not writing new scripture, okay? They're, they're, they're not founding the church again. Uh, the, the, found that the, the apostle, apostles of today are operating as a gift of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Hallelujah. Say, yeah. yes, I understand that, John. <laughs> Do you? Not very, but not very uh, excited about that. Okay, but apostolic succession is not taught in the Bible. There are no longer any foundation apostles. If you believe that that word of God is still being written by apostles today, I'm sorry, but I have to. I, I would have to say I, I, I disagree with you. Okay, all right. If, if you believe that there are apostles today who are still founding. Our church, that they are the founding pillars of our church. I would have to say, I'm sorry, I disagree with you, okay? Uh, biblically, scripturally, and, and also uh, just observationally, I, I would have to disagree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 2.20, and, and we use this verse last class, and, and they are built upon the foundation. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, referring to the original apostles of the Lamb, what we call foundational apostles. Say that with me. Foundational, foundational apostles. apostles. They do not operate in the church anymore. Apostles today are fivefold ministry or ascension, okay? They're fivefold ministry gifts, what we call apostolic giftings, okay? 
We do have apostles today. We do have prophets today. We do have uh, evangelists and pastors. We do have teachers today. But they're, they're not apostolic. We're not po apostolic. We, we are operating as a gift to the church. Praise God. Those who purport that apostles and prophets no longer exist, uh, they overlook. Now, there are some that say, okay, yeah, the foundational apostles are gone, and, and, and we, know, we don't have any apostles today. The fivefold ministry was only for the, the, the first century church. And then after the first century church died, then those giftings died. Uh, manifestation giftings died. Uh, no, we as Holy, uh, Holy Spirit-filled believers believe that the fivefold ministry still exists today Amen. and that the manifestation gifts of the Spirit exist yes. today as well. Amen. All right? That's why we study these giftings. All right? yes. Thank you. A fivefold ministry rather than a fourfold ministry. We've talked about this before, and the reason we're going over it again is because in the evangelical community, Spirit-filled people are a minority, okay? You do realize that, don't you? We are a minority in the evangelical community. The, the majority of evangelicals are born-again, blood-bought, born-again Christians, but they are not spirit-baptized people, all right? In fact, they, we can agree with them for where they are, but they can't agree with us for where we are. Okay, they believe that what we are experiencing is emotionalism or something that has to do with our our, our uh, uh, physiological makeup. Uh, that it's not real. Okay, uh, now in that minority group that we are in, the majority of the minority believe in a fivefold ministry. Uh, others believe in a fourfold. But there's more of us that believe in a fivefold than do in a fourfold. And the reason I'm going over this is because somewhere out there, if you congregate with other spirit filled believers outside of this church, somewhere along the line, you're going to run across somebody who believes in fourfold ministry. All right? Now, it's not that big of a deal, but I believe that we should, as Paul said, we should always have an answer for what we believe. Yes. Okay? Now, it. I, as we're going to see and as we've discussed before, it's more difficult for us to prove from a biblical perspective that fivefold yeah. is correct and fourfold is not, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody that really knows their word, you have to be careful because they can chop you to pieces real quick, all right? And, but ours is based more on observation, which I believe is a test, a, a, a proving of things that are true, uh, ours is more of an observation than it is a biblical uh, perspective, okay? And we're going to see that as we go through it again. So y'all bear with me on this redundancy. I keep using that word redundant. I can't help it. You're going to hear things tonight that's been said over and over again, but there's purpose in it, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. All right. A five-fold ministry rather than a four-fold ministry. Four-fold ministry believe that the pastor and the teacher are one gift. Five-fold can't be proven by biblical text. We'll look at that just a little bit tonight, either in Greek or English. But it can only be proven by simple observation of anointings. We see that the five-fold is correct. We must recognize that apostles prophets, pastors, and evangelists can also be teachers, although not a requirement. All should be preaching the good news of the gospel, okay? No matter which gift. Uh, we're going to look at it a little deeper when this comes along to teaching. We're going to look at the apostle first, Bill Shidler, theologian, pastor. When it comes to a study of the fivefold ministry in the New Testament, Prophets are mentioned a few times. The evangelist is specifically mentioned a couple of times. Pastors and teachers are referred to occasionally, but apostles are mentioned often. Now, I dug a little deeper, came up with my own stats. 
The New Testament speaks of the office of evangelist three times in the King James. The office of pastor one time. Now, pastor is the Greek word poimen, and it's translated as pastor in the New Testament. But it's also translated as shepherd 18 times. Now, it could be translated as shepherd when the shepherds were tending their flocks on Christmas Eve, okay? Or it could be talking about a shepherd that shepherds the flock of God, meaning what we would call a pastor, all right? Uh, but the word is used some 18 times, one time translated into the word pastor, and 17 times translated into the word shepherd. The office of the prophet is mentioned numerous times in the New Testament, but almost always it's quoting Old Testament prophets. We don't have a lot of real New Testament information about the office of the gifting of prophet because what word we have in the New Testament is a lot, but it's about the Old Testament prophets. Okay? Now, studying the Old Testament prophets will help us somewhat in knowing about New Testament prophets. But there is a difference, okay? There is a difference. Um, the apostles are referred to in the New Testament some 83 times. But you'll never find the word apostle in the Old Testament, okay? Not in the, 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 uh, uh, the context that we use, especially the context that we use the word apostle. Now, if you have any questions, you can stop me at any time, and I'll be glad to stop, and y'all may have to get me back online where I was, but I'm happy to stop and, and, and attempt to answer any questions that you might have. In chapter 3, we studied the restoration of the ministry offices of the church and recognized that the gift of apostle began to be restored around the start of the 1990s, okay? Uh, being the last office to be restored, it is probably the most misunderstood. Man, I read articles all the time about the office of apostle, and I mean, nobody really knows and everybody is in disagreement. I mean, the, 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 the apostle for what the apostle he or she is supposed to be, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to fit into. I'm reminded of Paul when he was on the Damascus Road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he was trying to fit himself as a square pig into a round hole yeah. uh, and, and honoring God. And when, when he got uh, the bright light, from Jesus, he saw the, the, the truth and change, praise God. Amen. But, but as, as we, we need to see how, how to, to get the square peg in a round hole as far as the, the office of apostle is uh, concerned in today's church. All right, you agree Amen. with me? Amen. It's, it's misunderstood right now. See, we, we've accepted uh, the, the, the prophet. The church has accepted the prophet and began to rock and roll, to begin flowing with that, that gifting, beginning to, to, to submit to it when it's in authority. See, there are times that our giftings, we're in authority and others are supposed to, to submit. Then we are in submission to the authority of their gift, okay? Uh, right now, you're in submission to the authority of my teaching gift. Nobody's jumping up. And, 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 and shout, hey, I, I, I want to say this, I want to say that. And you may raise, raise your hand and want to comment or ask a question. I've given you the liberty to do that, okay? And, uh, but uh, the, the one that, that is walking in that, that the office, that giftedness, has the authority when that giftedness is being demonstrated. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But the apostle is really going to do it. Understood, misunderstood. The modern gift of apostle works at establishing, establishing new works, churches, and seeing them come to maturity. There are different schools of thought, and they see some see the apostle planning a new work, setting a pastor in place, 
and then maintaining, maintaining oversight only to those churches that he or she originated. Then there's another school which says, okay, uh, apostles can also be invited to oversee a church they did not establish. Now, Paul addressed that. He said, if I be not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. I am an apostle to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are you and the Lord. I established this work, he's saying. You are mine, okay? Now, now, I'm not an apostle to others. Now, they may call him to be an apostle over them. Mm -hmm. That's something different. We have no apostle over this church. I don't see that we need one at this moment in time. But if we ever reach a place where we feel like we need apostolic overship, then we might call an apostle, even though he didn't establish his church, he or she didn't establish his church, or we might call them just for apostolic overship. That would be up to us as to whether we did or not. I, I, I believe it can work both ways, okay? I do know that the apostle, when they establish a work, a church or a ministry or whatever, and then they go on, they plan a pastor, and they go on to, to, to uh, establish another one, create another one, that they are indeed, they can't be voted out of that, mm -hmm. all right? Because God has set them in that. Mm -hmm. And they are apostles over those plantings over those churches, over those ministries that have been established. What if one falls off a cliff and really goes haywire, John? Well, that's something that has to be worked out, okay? I'm not talking about situations where you have a man or a woman that's real solid in the faith and in the gifting of apostolship. And let's say somewhere along the line they get some kind of dementia or, 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 or something that gets them off course. Well, surely you've got to deal with that, Okay. I'm not saying that you let a loose cannon uh, guide the, the, the ship, so to speak, all right? But otherwise, I believe what the apostle establishes, he or she has authority over those works. You get a lot of what I believe. <laughs> It's my class, so you do get a lot of what I believe, okay? And you know that I ask you to search the scriptures, to talk to God, to come up with your own conclusions about things, okay? I put enough seed out there just to kind of get you interested in it, all right? I hope you do follow up on it. Okay. Have I read that? Okay. The God-given special calling and anointing to serve and strengthen the body of Christ by launching and leading new ministry ventures, which advance God's purpose and expand his kingdom, often in a geographical area. The original Greek meaning of the word is sent one with orders. One that has been sent, and they haven't just been sent. They've got orders as to what they're going to do once they get there. Literally, one sent with authority or an ambassador. An apostle may or not may not lead, may or may not be the lead authority in a local church. There are churches that are led not by pastors, by but by uh, apostles. Okay, uh, I see nothing wrong with that. However, if the apostle is a true apostle, he's not going to stay in that position of authority very long. He's going to be hunting. He or she is going to be hunting for a pastor for that congregation, for that work, okay? But for a period of time, uh, apostles can uh, be the authority in the church. People with this gift, if you are an apostle, uh, People say, well, I think I'm an apostle. <laughs> Let me tell you, you better be sure, because it's a one hard life. I mean, it's probably the one of the hardest giftings to walk out of any of them. I don't think anybody would just wish it on themselves. They are visionary, and they see the big picture. They, they don't see just the picture of the church. They see the picture of the churches. 
They, they, they see the picture of regional uh, happenings in churches and what's going on in regional boundaries and then national boundaries and then world boundaries, okay? They're, they're, they're visual as a whole lot greater than one church or even just two churches, okay? They're visionaries and they see the bigger picture. I mean, real big picture. They have a unique calling to start new endeavors as directed by God. Most often, uh, often those endeavors are churches. They can be ministries. They can be helps of different kinds. I've seen apostles who have begun feeding uh, organizations mm -hmm. to feed the hungry around the world. Okay, mm -hmm. And you say, that, well, that's a ministry. Well, yeah, it is, but it, 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 the purpose <coughs> of it is to feed the hungry. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, I do have seen apostles begin those, okay, and oversee them. Uh, again, placing somebody, uh, some type of, of, of pastor or some type of director over them to manage them uh, on a daily, monthly, and uh, uh, yearly basis, mm -hmm. all right? Right. Uh, the apostles, I've only known, I think, one that I knew was a real apostle. And let me tell you, apostles are eat up with their gifting and their calling. They can't think about anything else. It's on their mind 24-7. They're working at it 24-7. I mean, they have to be careful to make sure they put time in for their family, their spouse. Uh, most of them are full time, and because nothing can compete with the call of God on their life, they have it. They're they're just eat up with it. All right. Uh, doesn't mean that a, a person being groomed as apostle can't be part time. All right. Can't have a secular uh, uh, and secular job or, or business or whatever, okay? But but uh, they are eventually going to be in it full time. I, I just about assure you. Uh, willing to work hard to see churches mature and reach their full potential for God. Mm -hmm. uh, apostles have their own network of churches and ministries and works, but yet they their apostolic thinking is that they want to see all churches succeed. You know, I mean, they're, they're, if, if they're called to another church that's outside their network of churches, hey, they're Johnny on the spot. They want to be there. They want to be a help to the ecclesia, the people of God, whether it's something they've planted or not. It's not just about their churches. It's about all churches. It's about everything that God's doing. It's about kingdom. Kingdom. Amen. They often are called to oversee multiple churches or <coughs> ministries. Even the, un, uh, the ones they did not establish, they may be called to come in and to oversee them. Mm -hmm. if, if, they're, if they're really anointed and they have applied themselves and, and they have allowed God to groom them and to bring them up to where they need to be to, to oversee, the anointing to oversee and develop churches and ministries and works, other networks of ministries and churches uh, without apostolic oversight are going to see them. And it may be that at times they're called in, mm -hmm. like a single church would call them, and a, a, a multiplicity of churches, a network of churches, uh, you know, under a denomination head might call them in for help mm -hmm. and counsel. Uh, they often have their sights on and they travel to the nations. Uh, that's the big picture in them. They can't help it. They don't just see it here or wherever they are. They, they see it in the whole nation. Mm -hmm. they, they see it worldwide. And they're willing. I mean, this is where it starts getting hard. This is where it starts getting difficult for the man and woman of God. It's not, it's not an eight-hour-a-day uh, job. It's not an eight-hour-a-day calling. I mean, it takes your whole life. It, it takes everything that's in you to do it. That's why the, the, the apostles come lately. The, you know, the ones that jump up and say, I, I feel like I'm supposed to be an apostle. <laughs> they probably had the furthest thing from it. Huh? 
They are known to welcome risky new challenges. That separates out a whole lot of people right there. And they're willing to encounter many, many. hardships. Many hardships. I thank God I'm not called to that gift. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to handle those hardships. I'm a, I'm a pure happy person. I like to feel good. Y'all know me. I get up every Monday morning I put my happy on. I put my feel good on. I want everything to work out. I want to sit down and pay my bills and the money be in the bank before when they're due. I mean, I pay them before they're due. I, I don't want hardships. I don't want people in my face saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. No, you can't go in that direction. Okay? And, and boom. You got to be ready. Apostles have to be ready for hardships. They are known to operate in the supernatural. Mm -hmm. This separates the apostles from the wannabes yes. many, many times. Yeah. Are they operating in the supernatural? Yeah. Are they? Perfect. Eagle Life Church, I got this from Eagle Life Church. I, I, I thought it was outstanding. They, they, they do so much better job at it than I do. I, you're you're going to see Eagle Life Church in and out of this. Uh, for the rest of this uh, chapter. Any questions? Any comments? Again, redundant. In addressing the current movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation, the NAR, we see an influx of candidates for the apostolic office. But are all of those God called? Are all of those anointed? Are those men and women carrying the mandate of the apostle of the apostle for today's world? Time, I just that's the only way I could answer it. Time proves all things. I'm sure in that movement there are probably some genuine apostolic giftings. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. From my perspective, the binoculars I'm looking through, I don't see it. I, I see the majority of them stepping up and paying their dues to have oil poured on them. Mm -hmm. And so they could make their business cards and say, Apostle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I'm not saying there's not some genuines in there. Yeah. And I know from what I see, there's a lot of the others. Mm -hmm. That's true. Be careful of that in a I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying they're all bad, okay? When you pick up on it, and you will in time, if you, if you talk to enough spirit-filled Christians, there's going to be some of them that are going to be into it, okay? Eventually. Okay. <laughs> I, I ought to just hand uh, uh, the, the glass over to the, to the prophet of the house. I, I, I'm sure he can give us a whole lot more insight than I can on his own gifts, all right? <laughs> But the prophet, we're going to start off with the Old Testament prophet. There were two types of prophets in the Old Testament relating to the way that they functioned. They were the, the seer and the nabi. Okay? Now, uh, in Hebrew, there's two words for seer. Okay? And I, 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 I know good at Hebrew at all. Okay? <laughs> I, I just got it up there. That's all I did. Okay? And, and, and one of them... <laughs> means seer, okay? And it's H-O-Z-E-H -O -Z -E -H is the first word. It's how we pronounce or spell it in English. And the second one is R-O apostrophe E-H. And it also means seer, okay? All right, now, the difference, the ministry of a seer is to see a vision. And this type of prophet saw a vision of what God wanted him to speak. And I don't say him or her when I'm talking about this prophet because Old Testament prophets, I believe they were all, correct me if I'm wrong, but they were all men, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not true of, of the gifting of prophet today. We have men and women that operate and in that gift. Okay, so they saw, the seer saw. Say, the seer saw. The seer, seer saw. That should, that, that, that should be easy to remember. The seer saw. 
Okay. The next the Navi. Okay, and there's the Hebrew word for anybody want to take a shot at that? Okay. All right. I know it's pronounced Navi in English. Okay. Or it's close to how it, it's supposed to be pronounced. Anyway. Okay. Now it means to call. The ministry of an Abi is to speak for the Lord God to the people. This caliber of prophet, not that he was any greater than the seer, I don't believe that there was a, 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 a one that was more important than the other. Okay? They were just different. This caliber of prophet spoke spontaneously, not seeing as the seer did, but just a gushing forth of the words of God out of his mouth. We, 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 see the, we see the seer that sat in his cave and meditated on God until God came upon him and almost like a mantle bringing a vision. And, and, and once he saw that vision, he was confident to begin to step out and speak to the children of Israel what God was saying to them. Mm -hmm. Then the other, the Nabi, he's spending his time with God as well. But he gets no picture. All he gets is he, uh, that sensing of a deposit probably, and I'm guessing at this point, a deposit going into his inner person, okay? Mm -hmm. I can't say spirit because they, they didn't have spirit. They didn't have the, the Holy Spirit like we have today, and, and, but it was going into his inner dwelling place. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he felt like it was I wanted to come up through his mouth. And so he would step out then to the people, he'd go into the city and just open his mouth without even knowing what was really going to come out. I mean, it just flowed out. It bubbled forth, okay? In fact, I, I've, I've seen the Nabi uh, defined as an expression of bubbling forth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> bubble, bubble, yeah. <laughs> now, how does that relate to gifts of the Spirit of today? How, how, how does that relate to, uh, and we're going to take a little side uh, uh, trip here and say, that's okay, John. That's okay, okay John. But, but how, how, how does that relate to the uh, to the the, the prophet of, of, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, or, uh, that is wanting to usher words of wisdom, words of knowledge, the prophetic voice, all of that, or how does it relate to the, the, the man or woman who stands in the gifting, <coughs> the fivefold ministry gifting of prophet? I don't know. I'm not a prophet, okay? I, I, I can prophesy by the Holy Ghost within me uh, by manif manifestation gifting. I, I, I don't know anything about the office of prophet other than what I experience in, in that. But I know it seems like I see a little, I have a little bit of both. Sometimes God will, I'll be praying for somebody and, and I will see something. And when I begin to minister that to, to them, that which I'm seeing, I can tell they are being affected by it. Mm -hmm. You know, either the eyes are getting as big as golf balls. I guarantee you, when you're praying for them, their eyes get as big as golf balls. You've got their attention. Something's happening on the inside of them. Or they start crying or whatever. Or they, they look at you real funny like, how do you know that? You know, I mean, you know, or whatever. Or are they denied? They're in denial. No, not me. Not me. That doesn't happen to me. I got it all together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why I don't pray. I mean, I've had people, and you have too, that, I mean, they, they were drug up by somebody else that had brought them saying, they need prayer. <laughs> you know, I want you to pray for them. Well, I learned a long time ago, if they don't want prayer, I ain't going to pray for them, okay? Yeah. Because they're not going to receive it anyway. So I ask them, do you want me to pray for you? And then most time they go, and I'll say, y'all just sit back down. And, and but but if they want me to pray for them, then I mean, you got to get ready because it's not me. Now, I had to learn that. I had to learn that it's not little John boy. Okay, I don't have anything in me to give them. I don't have anything in me to offer them. But when I take that step and I stand up and I'm willing for that person to come up and and ask for prayer 
And if I'm willing to put my hand on their forehead or touch them on the shoulder and make, make a point of contact there, and, and God will do the rest. Mm -hmm. Amen. He Definitely begins to come up on the inside of me, and I do things and I say things that I have no idea. I would not have come up with that. All right? But I do know this. My whole point in it is, is that when I'm ministering, I get, sometimes I get a picture. But the majority of the time, I get no picture. It's just a bubbling up. Lay my hands on them. And I start praying in the Spirit a little bit. And then all of a sudden, here it comes. And it, it comes out of me. And sometimes faster than I can speak it in English almost. I trip over my words because it's coming so fast. And, 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 I, and it does the work. I don't, I don't know how, but it does the work. Does it do it every time? No, I wish I could say every time that that worked, but it doesn't. But the more I'm willing and the more that I've paid the price in prayer, it'll work. And if it'll work with John Boy, it'll work with anybody that has a heart to want to minister to people. Praise God. Amen. Amen. But, but mine is more, if it could be comparable to Old Testament, and I'm not saying it is, mine is more of a Nabi, yours might be more of a seer. It doesn't matter. If yours is more of a seer, then you're going to be able to express that, that, that vision that you see in a whole lot better way than I ever could. All right? Or anybody else ever could. But the Old Testament, there were two types of prophets. And I believe that when you experience uh, the manifestation gift uh, it, uh, the Holy Spirit, that somehow a little bit of the same two categories start to surface, start, mm -hmm. start, start to come into play. All right. Uh, the caliber of prophet spoke spontaneously, not seeing as the seer did, but just a gushing forth of the words of God out of his mouth. All right. Getting back to Eagle Life Church again. The prophet. And Pastor Phil, I give you liberty anytime you want to jump in here and say something, make a comment, ask a question. I, I, I don't have a corner on this. Uh, I don't have a corner on anything, but I especially don't have a corner on, on this gifting, okay? All right. The prophet. Eagle Life Church says in contrast to the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament prophet did not exist until Jesus ascended on high. Hallelujah. Making the Old Testament model obsolete. So therefore, who was the last Old Testament prophet? Would it be John? John the Baptist? John the Baptist. Ah, John the Baptist. Operating in New Testament times, but right. he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Okay, all right, we see some scripture there. One of, the, one of the root words for prophet is to make known one's thoughts, to declare. Therefore, the prophet makes known and declares the thoughts of God in both, both foretelling and foretelling. Right, now, foretelling and foretelling can be confused a little bit because foretelling is just predicting the future. It's just telling you what's going to happen out there, okay? And foretelling is bringing that future up here and showing it to you. Okay? It's still the future, mm -hmm. but you brought it up here. That's foretelling. Mm -hmm. It's bringing the future and showing it to you. And I can tell the difference when a prophet is foretelling and foretelling. Because those that are foretelling, I mean, you see what they're talking about through the expression of their words. One's not better than the other. Right. In fact, probably they do both, you know, almost simultaneously, okay? They could go from foretelling to foretelling mm -hmm. back again and whatever. Mm -hmm. I should feel agrees with that, so we're probably on the right track. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, the New Testament prophet operates in the God-given special calling 
and anointing to serve and strengthen the body of Christ by offering messages from God that comfort, encourage, guide, warn, or even reveal sin in a way that leads to repentance and to spiritual growth. Amen. There's always a motive behind what they do. It's not just to be prophetic and tell you if they're ministering to you specifically as individuals, not just to not just to tell you about what's going on in your life, but but to, in a way that it offers encouragement and guidance to correct yourself, to to correct your movements, you might say. See, see, I wouldn't do well as a prophet. <laughs> I don't know what I is. <laughs> I'd say, let's burn him today, God. <laughs> you know, I mean, Elijah called that. Was Elijah, Elijah. Call that fire down. Yeah. Burn him. <laughs> Man, I pour more water on him. Do it four or five times. Get them all wet. <laughs> then burn them. <laughs> <laughs> a prophet may or may not be the lead authority in a local church I have seen prophets establish churches uh, I don't know why but the majority of time you know, at first they're, they have an influx of people because it's, it's a charismatic gift and every, it, it really it touches everybody so, so they come in like droves. But because that's what they're there for, when you begin to bring other offices and giftings in and establish doctrine and, and guidelines and everything, those people that came in, they didn't come in for that. They, they came in just for the prophetic. Right. When the prophets fall, but they have a, it has a tendency to just kind of dwindle, all right? I, I'm not saying a prophet can't lead a local church and be authority in that local church, be a good authority in that local church, but you just don't see it happen very often. Uh, God has something else for prophets, all right? I mean, the, the job they do is very important. All right. People with this gift, men and women, are recognized by the church for communicating God's word through a variety of means. When you get that foretelling and forthtelling in operation, <laughs> in a ministry, especially a vocal ministry, in front of the congregation, then there's a variety of things that are going on. A variety of things. Uh, People with this gift have God-given spiritual vision for the church. You all know, heard me talk about it. There's really two types of prophets today. There's, there's uh, uh, prophets to the nations and prophets to the people, I believe. All right? Uh, that's my opinion. But I, it, the prophets to the nations, that's where you're going to find them. Out there. Okay? Prophets to the people are going to be found in here. And so they have a spiritual vision for not only for the ecclesia, but for the church itself, the government of the church, the, the, uh, the policies of the church. They, they have good input into all of that. The prophetic gift has. People with this gift share strong biblical convictions to challenge others challenge to exhort prophets are normally good exhorters and they challenge others through biblical convictions they're able and willing to apply church discipline and correction or false teaching now really out of all of the giftings in the fivefold ministry I believe this is the only one that is uh, categorized to bring correction for
for false teaching. Uh, based on that, Pastor Phil would have every right, if he's moved so by the Spirit of God, if he detected something in my teaching that was not in line with the Word of God, I think that most prophets would approach the teacher individually, privately, and discuss it. But he has the right and privilege to, uh, to bring correction even in front of the congregation. Ooh. People with this gift may have spiritual experiences far beyond what the normal Christian has. Audible voices, angelic visitations, visions, dreams. They will passionately desire others to hear God's voice and know God's heart. Back, back to these experiences. They don't have to have these experiences. Or they may just have one or two of them. But they're more apt, I believe, to have those experiences. The prophetic gifting is a deep spiritual gifting. And I believe that they would be uh, more inclined to have these type of spiritual experiences than, let's say, a teacher. Okay? <clears throat> I don't think, I, I, I'm not saying that a teacher, that I can't have angel. I've never had an angel visit me. I can guarantee you that. Now, Pastor Phil may have, and I'm not asking. But no. I've never had an angel come into my house, sit down and pull up a chair and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Gabriel, or I'm Michael. I just came here to talk today. I, I never had that. I've read about it in books. I, there was a time in my life that I even asked God, why don't I have the experiences that I see people have in these art magazine articles, in these books, you know? I don't have to have them as a reason. There's no purpose in it. There was a purpose in it. He sent an angel to talk to me about it. <laughs> visions, audible voices. I've never heard God with these right here. Man, I have heard God for years and years. But with these outer flanges, never heard one whisper that was God. It's always in here. But God speaks to me through a lot of things. Not just in here. He speaks to me through that word. Amen. He speaks Amen. to me through experiences. Yeah. He speaks to me through beauty. I mean, a lot, a lot of different ways God, God speaks to me through the earth. It amazes me how much she knows. Mm -hmm. My gosh, I thought I had learned a lot over the last 40 years. If I sit down and listen to her, man, she has excelled in it. Huh. Okay. They will passionately desire others to hear God's voice. And to know his heart. A person can have the Romans 12 motivation gift of prophecy. You remember in Romans 12, we, we, we uh, the seven motivation gifts, and one of them was prophecy. Mm -hmm. We called it the, 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 the gifting of perceiver. Okay? A lot of times, a perceiver, when they start coming into their own and, and they start you know, giving word and and because that's what they're getting through their perceiver gift, all of a sudden, not all of them, but, uh, but some of them start think, oh my gosh, I must be a prophet. You know? I'm giving word. I mean, I, I'm, I'm telling people what God is saying. And, and, and so it's, they are definitely a prophetic voice. And I believe that, that prophets who are being groomed not by people, but by the Holy Ghost for that gifting, that office of prophet. They're being groomed for that. God is grooming for that. I think that the church should call that person, man or woman, a prophetic voice because they haven't fully received the mantle yet of prophet. And, but yet they're operating in the spiritual realm. They're, they're, they're getting words of wisdom and words of knowledge. They're, 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 they're beginning to, to, 
to see pictures or to see or are they're beginning to, to, to feel like they're, they got something bubbling up on the inside of them as an IV to, to usher forth, okay? But until they had that full mantle, you can disagree with me, but it, until they had that full mantle on them, they're not really standing in that office, that gifting of prophet, but yet they are a strong uh, spiritual voice, prophetic voice, you might say. All right? Amen. Okay. Evangelist? Okay. We're going to... It's 7 o'clock exactly. This is where we will stop because uh, evangelist is a good... A good uh, uh, gifting to uh, to talk about, to get out in the open, and to talk about it. And what, what's really biblical about the gifting of evangelists? Okay, and uh, we're going to see some things. Uh, I, I even get some scripture that uh, I enjoy. I so enjoyed Wayne's message Sunday morning. I mean, Amen. he sat down on the very scripture that we're going to use. And, <laughs> In, in uh, uh, talking about some of these, especially evangelists, as we go along, and, and uh, the uh, I have my opinion about some of them, and you have to understand that I did write this before last Sunday, so mine was already solidified by the time that he, not that it means anything, he got it just as well as I did, praise God. By the wow. Spirit of God, but they are a little different a couple of, in a couple of areas, and not anything that uh, opinion sometimes is a good thing. Praise mm -hmm. God, Hallelujah! So next week we will uh, start with evangelists. Any questions? We'll say good night to our social media. Thank you for visiting with us. Hope you had a good time, and hope you'll return.